Some of you may have uh, been expecting Michael Moore since uh, Sandra Gilman is such an eminent uh, co-panelist. And just to not disappoint you, I wanted to say shame on you, Mr. Bush. <laughs> um, and also, uh, I was just struck by the, the conjuring of Horvath and Stanley and Lutz Bush Horvath, or at least let's put pieces on Horvath on the table. Um, and, and I was, was hoping that maybe one of the things this, this conference can produce is, uh, is the kind of trait, trait that Gramsci suggested when he wrote from Woods and Woods Driven, and he suggested that the task of critical elaboration was precisely to produce an archive of traces which have not left an inventory. Now, I don't know that inventory is necessarily the modality, but I hope that we can, we can in a sense, archive a series of traces here today. Um, I also want to track, note the tracking from trace in the singular to trace in the plural that, that David outed at the beginning. And I thought this was conjuring in another sense, because I thought this was clearly an allusion to the English translation of Foucault's Society Must Be Defended and the transition he makes between race war and war of races. So I just assumed that that was the organizer's way of bringing the, the specter of Foucault, um, which is what I'll talk about today. In 1959, Nelson Mandela critiqued the constitutive violence of apartheid's racialized spaces, deeming them sites of African subjection. He blasts what he termed Ferward's tribalism, apartheid's spatially segregated multiculturalism, by locating African rights in the so-called Bantustans, segre uh, excuse me, uh, by, by locating uh, uh, rights in the so-called Bantustans, Mandela argues, apartheid produces political exclusions from citizenship, democracy, and sovereignty. Rather than natural ethnic homelands, the Bantustans emerged, Mandela argues, out of the encroachments and depredations of generations of European land sharks. Racialized subjection for Mandela pivots on the disciplining of bodies and populations in governmentalized territories. Like all racisms, Derrida argues, apartheid tends to pass segregation off as natural, a system of marks. It outlines space in order to assign forced residence or to close off borders. As a form of state racism, he stresses, apartheid invokes a discourse of natural right, binding subjects to racialized space. Technologies of government here link race, space, and nature, suggesting their mutual production rather than their essential ontology. As entangled specters, perhaps their assemblage conjures a hauntology, an arrival as a coming back, but a coming back with a difference. Today, I think the proposition that racism's naturalized in relation to what Foucault terms governmentality. I explore the notion of racialized governmentality while foregrounding the contested terrain of nature. For Foucault, race is a mobile discourse, a polyvalent discourse, not pinned to a stable biological meaning. In one of his few explicit references to colonialism, Foucault refers to the boomerang effect colonial practice can have on the juridico political structures of the West. Racism, Foucault asserts, first develops with colonization. It is the precondition that renders possible subjection to the regulatory management of the unequal risk of life itself. Witness racialized disparities in life expectancies, incarceration, violence, access to health care, and entitlements to resources. Yet when he tracks the discourse on race struggle, as it morphs through distinct moments of European history, Foucault limits his reflections to Europe's biopower spatial history, including the imperial entanglements productive of racisms. In, his, in this room alone, Ann Stoller, Barner Hesse, and David Goldberg have done much to challenge Foucault's Eurocentric history of racism's routes. Might we provincialize governmentality, to use Dipesh Chakrabarti's term, rendering race and racisms within 
both imperial histories and their post-colonial traces. Focusing on transformations in European regimes of rule, Foucault argues the government did not refer only to political structures or the management of states, rather it designated the way in which the conduct of individuals or groups might be directed. To govern in this sense is to structure the possible field of actions of others. This mode of power requires subjection to government. Individuals and groups exercise agency, but not as sovereign subjects authoring their own consciousness. Power, in Foucault's famous phrase, acts upon their actions by directing, leading, and compelling those governed. Yet this relative freedom, this submission to government, keeps alive the possibility of refusal or revolt. The multiform strategies of power, crucial to modern European forms of rule in this vision, work through the process of cultivating conduct. Foucault fused verb and noun, glossing the key word of conduct, both in the sense of leading others, including mechanisms of coercion, and also as a way of behaving. Conduct both orchestrates and it compels. A provincialized governmentality would better appreciate the entanglements of race, space, and power in colonial modernity and its aftermath. Fanon famously saw the production of racial subjectivities working through the process of epidermalization. The white gaze's inscription of black bodies through the hegemony of vision, the inscription of the skin, its surface. Yet technologies of territoriality also shape geobodies that subject racialized populations and discipline human bodies. By producing governable territory, Regimes of rule both racialize space and spatialize race. Foregrounding the constitutive violence that produced spaces of segregation, Mandela chronicled apartheid's grim program of mass evictions, political persecution, and police terror. Apartheid's project was to forge self-governing racial subjects whose phantom sovereignty would discipline ethnicized populations in discrete tribal territories. Mandela also argued that these separate enclaves, while spatially disparate, represented a single integrated system based on the exploitation of African labor by white capitalists. Here we may sense specters of Marx south of the Limpopo. Recall Marx's chronicling the dispossession of Europe's poor through the Georgian enclosures. The force and violence that underwrote the two foundational freedoms of capitalism. Marx's ironic use of freedom refers both to land dispossession and subjection to coercive labor relations. In Das Kapital's volume three, he adds the dangerous supplement of land to capital and labor to form a holy trinity. He locates the realm of freedom, his terms, in relation to both labor and land, the latter an expansive terrain of environmental resources spatial milieu, and socialized ecologies. Freedom, for Marx, is a relational contingent space where we are subjected. Freedom here is a terrain of subjection produced through social relations, political economic processes, and discursive practices. For Foucault, modern power works through, not against, freedom, structuring the field of others' possible actions. As Lisa Lowe reminds us, CLR James and the gang also harnessed freedom to reworkings of revolutionary history. Mapping the trading, its constitutive exclusions, those subjects entitled to claim its productive power and the relational spaces where freedom has been forged in multiple senses of the term. As I speak, Iraqis are enduring freedom, subjected to liberation through invasion, and many of us feel it's time for a regime of truth change. Outing these unfreedoms encourages us to query how race articulates in the twin sense of both joining and enunciation with other foundational fields. When Kipling penned The White Man's Burden, the U.S. was poised to invade the Philippines. Troops there targeted Los Moros, a racialized assemblage of insurrection, Islam, and cultural alterity. The White House burden of Bush's crusade betrays these imperial 
traces. Like race, nature too has a polyvalent mobility, transgressing scale, form, and asserted ontological ground. We might think of three provisional scalar horizons on which to situate the cultural politics of race and nature. Biopolitics, nanopolitics, and geopolitics. With apologies for my schematic rendering of these positions, I raise them to get us thinking collectively about both the relational routes and the mobile locations of race and nature. And obviously, they're not exhaustive. First, biopolitics has conceived of the regulation of populations, the disciplining of bodies, and the government of racialized subjects in relational terms. Unlike discipline, which targets bodies in spacing, biopower conceives the population as a political problem to be managed managing both life and death. This not only entangles constructions of race and species, but also includes the environments, the milieu, that, that promote the welfare of populations. Second, what Paul Gilroy terms nanopolitics, directs attention to technologies that locate race in DNA, in the salience of scanning and molecular genetics that configure contemporary racial imaginaries, or at least that shape them. Sandra Gilman's paper eloquently excavates some of these traces. How, he asks, have biomedical technologies created novel imagined communities of kinship in the age of genetically transmitted illness, creating cohorts of families of children with inherited diseases? Memories of group suffering here map onto biomedicalized body politics as gene, group, and risk mingle together. Third, the field of critical geopolitics, not Rumsfeld's kind, links geographical imaginaries, spatial practices of power, and the bounding of body politics. Thinking these analytics in tension, biopolitics, nanopolitics, and geopolitics, might help us track the traffic among race, nature, and culture. This assemblage might help trace the forms of polyvalent mobility that locate moving targets entangling racisms and naturalisms. A staggering amount of discursive labor has historically produced the terrain of nature as a site to anchor race. Discourses of nature work to cover their own traces, to efface the very production of nature's history. The hope of every ideology, writes Stuart Hall, is to naturalize itself out of history into nature. As ontological ground, inherent essence, and invariant truth, nature's rhetorical power hinges on strident disavowal of its pollution by power and by politics. The concept of landscape provides one useful means for understanding the workings of race and nature as contested terrains. Inherently duplicitous, the term refers both to visual perspective and to the geographical territories. It articulates both culture and nature, seer and seen. Mitchell conceives the term as a process by which social and, and subjective identities are formed. Landscape, in this formulation, works double duty. It naturalizes a cultural and social construction, and it also interpolates a beholder. When Billie Holiday sings the haunting words of Abel Maripol's 1939 song, Strange Fruit, she grafts evocative images of lynching onto harvested crops. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. While Gone with the Wind played in theaters, the song invoked the blood at the roots of racialized violence. Laboring black bodies shaped the very landscape yielding slavery's bitter fruit. Cultivated crops and human harvests provide ample means of illuminating what the seeds of racism have sown. Such historical entanglements in turn shape the cultivation of racialized subjects whose natures are frequently grafted to metaphors of roots, blood, and soil. Grappling with the violence of exclusive geographies Amé Césaire wrote of a world map made for my own use, not tinted with the arbitrary map of scholars, 
but with the geometry of my own blood. But blood could remap nature's roots, calling into question the geobodies of nation, empire, and diaspora. Césaire's anti-imperialism broke the shackles of biological destiny, elaborating a pan-Africanist concept of negritude that was, quote, no longer a cephalic index or plasma or soma, but measured by the compass of suffering. In the 40s, the Senegalese soldier Senghor lamented his black brother's blood that cleansed the nation, only to have their heroic struggles forgotten by imperial France. Sartu considered the critical geography made by sentiments of negritude what he termed a project of anti-racist racism, emphasizing its affective attitude toward the world. Negritude wrote suffering onto both bodies and landscapes together, suturing them, cultivating interior souls by evoking the mystical geography of violent imperialism and the remembered transatlantic slave trade. The cultural politics of memory also shapes Du Bois' vision of community, routes rather than roots, bondage rather than bloodlines, experience rather than essence, articulates race to self, soul, and embodied practice. These embodied practices are also insold. Breaking from the metaphorics of blood, Du Bois links his assertion that race is a cultural fact to a shared notion of group belonging. Reflecting on his own geographical imaginary of race and culture, Du Bois asked, as I face Africa, I ask myself, what is it between us that constitutes a tie which I can feel better than I can explain? His pan-Africanist vision mapped geographical imaginaries to imagine communities. Africa is a landscape of affect, of site of identification that locates race in relation to historical experience rather than biological destiny. Shared historical routes rather than fixed geographical routes would shape the com political community of African Americans. Transatlantic slavery for Du Bois produces a racialized identity of those who've had a common history, have suffered a common disaster, and have one long memory. In Dusk of Dawn, du, du Bois explains to a mythical white man that the black man is a person who must ride Jim Crow in Georgia. Translocal transport becomes a site for marking race. Du Bois renders visible the interpolation of a racialized subject, situating both his experience and race in technologies of government that discipline bodies, racial subjects, and populations. This relational rend discipline and spatial routes suggest generative affinities with Tong Chai's notion of the geobody, the term he deploys in Siam Mapped to explore technologies of territoriality. With an allusion to grounding of a body politics, we might sense a haunting of Hobbes. Just as bodies need to become persons, geobodies raise issues of property, progeny, and paternity. They're gendered as well as racialized. Campaigns of mass rape from Bosnia and beyond have used violence to bind gendered bodies, nations, and virulent cultural racisms. Society must be defended, but so too must la patria. We might ask about the kinds of geobodies that matter, how spatial assemblages come to assign identities to fixed territories, such as Bantustans, national parks, urban jungles, and the zones of homeland security. Xenophobia and nativism both pivot on bounding geobodies, geo on articulating a spatial horizon for polity, belonging, and identity. Ashila Mbembe argues that nativism and nationalism establish a quasi-equivalence between race and geography. I'm less convinced, Ashil, of your argument that Marxism does the same, especially in its post-colonial traces. That is, unless we want to get rid of the fellow travelers of Spivak, Chakrabarti, and Stuart Hall. A critical question becomes what kinds of geobodies articulate race and geography? What conjurings of nature animate these sites of passionate attachment, these landscapes of affect, these terrains of both cultural longing and belonging? 
Recall Hegel's insistence that the true theater of history is the temperate zone. Africa's geographical location places it not simply temporally before, but also spatially beyond universal history. In Hegel's imagined Africa, its inhabitants reflect the essential qualities of place, an isolated geography beyond historical development. Africans' primitive proximity to nature marks their exclusion from the realm of polity and ethical obligation. Freedom, for Hegel, the essence of humanity, is marked by its absence in Africa. External force rather than reason rule presides over an essential African passion. A ruler stands at the head, for sensuous barbarism can only be restrained by despotic power. Here, Hegel echoes the mid-18th century racial formations of Linnaeus. For Herder, nature continues to endow racially distinct bodies, populations, and landscapes with constitutionally different capabilities, yet cultural traditions imbue nations with relational distinction. Nature remains in the climate of a place, but Herder mapped cultural history to territorial creations, the homelands claimed as national soil. Before the emergence of modern European citizens, Herder stresses there was a time when the word human being, homo, assumed an altogether different meaning. It came to mean he who bears an obligation, a subject, a vassal, a servant. Whoever was not within these categories enjoyed no rights. His life was not secured, and those to whom these, these serving humans belonged were superior beings. Subjection to power to a recognized superior produced a regime of rights. Rights prevailed only within asymmetries of power. Herder historicizes humanity's subjections. He exhumes a constitutive unfreedom in the project of modernity. Perhaps here we may sense a hauntology in Foucault. Let me conclude with the provincialized governmentality of race and nature. First, echoing Herder, such a perspective emphasizes how human forms of freedom have been historically constituted through subjection in the spirit of provincialization of this freedom ride. This means, uh, in the spirit of Susan Buck Morris, thinking Hegel and Herder in relation to Haiti, but also Hunan and the land of Hottentots. This move radically enlivens geography within histories of alternative modernities, encouraging a spatial sensitivity to imagine geographies and situated practices of racialized subjection. Second, the cultivation of racial conduct, the targeting of an enabling milieu in which to encourage racial improvement, and the regulation of populations become key features of modernity. How do different governmentality, excuse me, how do different governmental technologies conceive and enact a robust recursivity between bodies, populations, environments, and the mobile locations of race? As Inderpaul Graywall makes lucidly clear in her post-911 analysis, emergent forms of cultural racism are folded into turbans adorning Middle East-looking men. Threatening racial subjects are at once epidermalized and sartorialized. This suggests thinking different modalities, technologies of assemblage in relation to bodies, populations, and spaces. Racialized subjects are interpolated through this assemblage of practices, institutions, and discursive formations that cannot be reduced to ideological state apparatuses. Third, governmentality is an analytic that emphasizes the contingent relationship among a crucial triangle, sovereignty, discipline, and government. Racialized subjection is produced in this crucible Challenging historically specific assemblages of racism entails realigning the tensions in this triangle, what I take to be Sandra Gilman's project and his call. This suggests a politics of positioning while recognizing that governmentality positions non-sovereign subjects in terrains not of their choosing. Invocations of Lebensraum, of a racialized living space, have spanned Ratzel, Hitler, Amiri Baraka, and Robert Mugabe as recently as last month. 
nation can become a naturalized ecology belonging, seeking to settle racist polyvalent mobility, yet that terrain between positioning and being positioned remains far from fixed. And I want to close with, for me, a condensed, uh, a condensed sign, literally a sign, on uh, BART on my way to the airport uh, in, San, in San Francisco um, that, for me, brings together nanopolitics, biopolitics, and geopolitics. Um, and I'll just read to you verbatim uh, the sign. The hip hop community is under attack. Fight for your right to live. Move against AIDS, a hip hopathon to support AIDS services in the Bay Area and Africa. Thank you.